Good afternoon. Good evening. Good night. And in some cases, good morning. To all humans and non humans, to all animals and non animals. To wherever you are, happy or sad, experiencing pleasure or pain or neutrality. Here we are with our woven quilt. Shining Dhamma beings. Many colors. Many co colors and many flavors. Many lovely designs. Fabrics and plants. And, and eyes, so many eyes, seeing eyes. <laughs> to take it all in, take each other in, and if you can feel seen yourself by everyone who's uh, entering your space. To feel seen, that's metta Brahma Vihara. And also uncon the unconditional acceptance of equanimity when we're seeing or when we see others just as they are. Uh, as you settle in, recalling that we we use the body and the senses, which are also the body, to turn primarily inward when we meditate. So just starting with the, the largest of our organs and most prominent of the six senses is our bodies. Just begin by being aware, abiding in body awareness, body knowing. You know, however, it naturally occurs to you in this moment. It's the light brush on the skin or maybe you feel temperature. Or the feather light sensations. And perhaps you feel other aspects of the earth element as it expresses, as it, as it presents in the body. Grainy sensations, ribbed sensations, smooth, silky, rough, hard, soft,
only just as they appear, not trying to pull up what isn't now being felt and known. So we're abiding in the body awareness as it is here and now. And it's a, it is being a vehicle for awakening by the abiding and through the knowing, the elemental knowing of the textures of the earth element, the fluidity and cohesion of the water element. Just here now in the body Water element is also how we experience heaviness in the body. Whereas the fire element, in addition to cool, warm, heat, is also manifest as lightness, as, as heat and gases tend to to rise up and be light in deep meditation. When you feel really light, like you're floating or being lifted up, the physical experience of that is a form of this fire element. And then the, the air element where we feel firmness, stiffness, uprightness, how we can sit up and stand up and move without folding in, without the body collapsing. It's this firmness of the air element. And also it's, it's nature of oscillation, of movement itself. And right down to the symphonic-like pulses, a very subtle vibrations. This is our body as it actually is. Yeah. Aside from the mirror image, aside of what we want it to be. And, and that aspect of the body that receives through the inner sensitivity receives light and form, color and various physical formations as light changes shape and form. Or just the pulsing of light and shadow In meditation, we regard inner imagery, inner visual experience, the same as outer visual experience. In the moment, it's just pure seeing, color form and knowing color and form, light, shadow, knowing light, shadow. And at the ear door, abiding in the inner sensitivity of receiving sound vibrations.
the symphonic experience of hearing. This total receptivity at rest, not anxious, not needing to name or proliferate for what the sound is. The experience of receiving sound and knowing sound vibration. Awareness. Just like water moving into the the spaces between the interstitial empty spaces between sound, between sensations. between light display, visual experience, the interstitial moments, between moments. Then bringing your awareness to the inner receptor of the nose that receives fragrance. There may be no immediate fragrance or perhaps there are real subtle ones we usually don't pay attention to. It's good practice just to move away from the identification and attachment that comes from, oh, I smell something really sweet. It's really beautiful, very pleasant. Or I smell something terrible. It's really unpleasant. To the here and now actual experience of the pureness of smelling, just smelling, pleasant or unpleasant. The reaction of liking, wanting, disliking, not wanting, or just a neutral abiding, uh, smelling. And then with the tongue, with this capacity, thousands of receptors or millions of receptors that receive flavor, taste. And then finally coming to rest in the solar plexus the physical physical side of the mind base, the base of knowing, the physical aspect of the knowing consciousness. And we've completed our, our six consciousnesses just have visited all of them, learning to know them without the I reference identification. That curious, adventurous spirit of simply wanting to know the as it is nature. of the body and the senses and the mind nature, the heart nature. So 
knowing your body as a anchor for present time awareness or the breathing process part of the body as an, as an anchor for present time awareness. And being anchored and knowing experience as it's arising, you can notice the mental moods, the tendency of approaching experience Aggress aggressively or softly. Our curious awareness stepping, stepping up from a abiding, relaxed mood, quality of mind. not to assess or analyze, figure out. When that part of the mind happens, the papancha mind that wants to categorize and interpret, associate and divide, then know that part of the mind for what it is. And determine whether or not you need that distraction in the moment. If not, set it aside and just try to be with the, the bare awareness of the bare nature a phenomena as it arises in the body, in the mind stream, through the senses. The sense that there's nothing to do. And appreciate the restfulness and, and care if there is no restfulness. Connect by adding the metta to the awareness stream, knowing things as they are with, through the lens of well wishing.
in the last part of our meditation together. If you like, call up the companions of the Brahma Viharas. One way to do that is to call up each one and just abide around the solar plexus area of the heart, chitta, and see which one resonates. And just rest with that, calling up metta, a profound, connective, and pure desire for the welfare of others and ourselves. Karuna. That emotion of activated care. That has the, the wish or desire to alleviate wherever there is dukkha, stress, pain, or anxiety. In living beings, in ourselves, our calling up mudita, that ap appreciative consciousness that indeed lives in the, the interstitial spaces so that moment when unpleasant or pain passes away is a moment if we pay attention of an appreciative joy, not just relief, but actually a lift. A delightful moment and calling up Upeka, the emotion of mental equipoise, wide mind, grounded heart, of profound stability and acceptance of things.
Jake, I can't hear you. <laughs> you can talk in silence if you want, but I think people want to hear. Can you hear me now? Now, can. Okay, it was going to be a really good talk, but <laughs> <laughs> you said most of it, right? <laughs> yeah, it's all finished. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I, I had the better quality mic on, but oh well. You can hear me, okay? What to do? <laughs> <laughs> when Steve dropped us into that quiet slow moving space almost like water the attention just gradually shifting from body elemental nature all the way through the senses to the heart center, consciousness. It was reminding me of a time many years ago in Burma and some of you may have been following the news there with a lot of courage and a lot of turmoil in the political realm and on the streets. But always in Burma, there has been this protection for places of Dhamma practice. The word for retreat center, yeta, means pleasant shade, uh, pleasant shade from the hot sun. And Stephen, my teacher, Upandita, his centers always had that feeling in the middle of this very always tense even when it was uh, in those years even when it was calm and not people in the streets it was tense background but in the meditation centers in upandita's places there was this real sense of protection and peace and i felt that being there both when I was on retreat and off retreat, studying as a young monk, uh, just in an outer way, feeling that kind of protection. I also um, Uh, was needy in, in a certain way. And because I was uh, able to learn Burmese quite quickly and some Pali um, and a young American monk who could speak Burmese, everybody really loved that. And I love to be loved. <laughs> Feeling a hole in me. <clears throat> the neediness in me. Or wanting to be special, or wanting to be great. Uh, 
so after I had gone actually as part of a world studies internship because Upandita had come to the big island to visit the land for the center in Javi. And it was the first time I met him. And I had a little bit of Burmese at that point, very, very little. So I greeted him in Burmese and he said, do you get good grades? <laughs> what? <laughs> They're okay, Santa. Okay, come to Burma and you can study Pali and study Burmese and be a monk. <laughs> And in that moment, he just sort of cast a spell. And then months and years later, it was realized. <laughs> so because of this seed he had planted in that moment, I registered with my school to do my study abroad, kind of as a my world studies internship as, um, as a monk. And I got credit for studying Burmese. I got credit for studying Pali. And I did that for six months. And I loved it so much. I loved being loved. And I loved being special. So um, I just took the next semester, absentia. And then I was still going. And actually, at that point, I decided I would, I want, I, <clears throat> maybe I would be even more great if I was actually a good meditator. So I, <laughs> so I thought I'd do a long retreat. And um, so I completely dropped out of college and kept going being a monk with Upandita. So the moment that I was thinking of when Steve dropped us into that, not just outer protection, but also the inner protection, quietude, just resting, body sensations, the ease of that. Thinking of a moment about three months into retreat, long retreat, just sitting by the Dhamma Hall and somebody who I had met before in the monastery came by and really we should have kept noble silence totally, but it, he thought it was probably okay, and I thought it was probably okay. And so he just said a few words. He said, you look like you're doing great. And I didn't realize it at the time. But actually, <laughs> that was enough to send me spinning because I had this thought, hmm, I am doing great. <laughs> <laughs> and I had really been struggling. I'd been pushing and pushing and pushing and trying to be great. But then I kind of forgot about it. And, and I just settled in for a little while, kind of the way Steve was le leading us. And I was just, I was starting to get quiet, but I hadn't noticed it. It was just sort of doing itself. And then this friend said, you look like you're doing great. That was all he said. And he, and he, and he walked away because we were being very careful about the noble silence. But it was enough because I thought, oh, Oh, I am doing great. This is great. <laughs> hmm. And I got a little attached. So the talk today um, will be a little bit on the what are called the corruptions of insight, this kind of subtle attachment that creeps in. The delight, really liking that feeling of quietude, the feeling of pleasure that I had in that moment sitting by the Dhamma hall with the mind at ease, or that I felt again just now when Steve dropped us in. a real sense of pervading just ease that can happen. And the way the mind can grab that and make that mine. <laughs> so a little bit on these subtle ways of grasping after practice experience. 
and a little bit on joy and maybe a little bit on evenness, sobriety, we'll see. That time, that first long retreat, which ended up being about five months, something sort of grabbed me at a certain point. There was a time I was describing where it really felt great and I felt like I was doing great. And you know, I so wanted to be great and I so wanted to be special. And Sero kept saying to me, I would report, and he said, that's not special. And I'd report another experience. He'd say, that's not special. I report another experience. That's not special. <laughs> and he just got my word. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> and at a certain point, I crumbled just into smithereens. It was so painful. I came home to the house where Steve is now, just in pieces, totally crushed. I wasn't going to be great. I wasn't going to be a great meditator after all. My whole world, just pieces on the ground. And it was really months there, Stephen and Michelle coming through at different times, trying to help me. Um, but one friend of theirs had suggested that I write down my dreams, so I did. And one dream after a few weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, in one dream, I was a superhero. And I really felt empowered. <laughs> and that, as soon as I woke up, all the crazy papancha, as he was saying, this running mind and my blood boiling and all of that was right back. But I remembered, I remembered what it was like in the dream in that moment when I hadn't felt that. I remembered what it was like to take a breath of air. And that was enough just to remember that like, there was a different experience possible than total panic all the time from moment <laughs> waking until sleep. That was enough to like, just orient me which way was up. If I was under the waves being tossed and turned and slowly I, I, I made it to the surface. So for me, joy, Steve was speaking about joy and last week he said, maybe I'd say something. For me, joy is like that this gladdening of the heart like a breath of fresh air a remembering that it's possible another uh, time in my life really difficult just a constant <laughs> um, teaching Similar in a way, but a constant pointing out of my um, weakness around arrogance, just constantly. Oh, the way you laughed. <laughs> oh, the. <laughs> and just feeling the impact of that in my body, constant churning. And... But there was also moments, you know, lying, taking a rest where I could lean into that aspect of a heart that's gladdened, that mem muscle memory of what joy feels like, this quiet celebration. And sometimes I just, tap into it for a moment and then be back in the churning of well, arr, arr, arr. <laughs> frustration and anger and exhaustion and hurt. But sometimes the energy of that churning would actually start powering the uplifting joy. 
<laughs> so that the feeling of gladness, the heart gladdened, it just starts to pervade the whole body like a sponge soaking up water, uplifting, and re releasing, rejuvenating. So for me, that kind of mudita, the heart gladdened, is just such an important doorway in and entryway into the ease of being with things as they are. And with the uplifting aspect of that gladdened heart, it's so important that the gra uh, groundedness of equanimity is underneath for that uplifting gladness to stay pure. If not, in me, the gladness can kind of come out almost giddy. And, you know, especially like if I like, <laughs> uh, I like something, it's aligned with my values, just almost a giddiness, really excited about it. But of course, there's not the equanimity that would treat evenly something that I feel aligned with and something I don't feel aligned with. If I like one kind of meditation practice and not another, somebody's telling me about, oh, they did this great Mahasi retreat, I might be really excited for them. Oh, that's great. But they did some other kind that might not have the same evenness. So there's this way in which joy has this beautiful uplifting quality that if I'm not careful, um, can start to miss the grounded equanimity that it needs to be pure, purely celebration. There is this sutta that I love in the Pali discourses that talks about form, forms of meditation practice. It lists you know, doing tranquility practice where you really quiet the mind with a one-pointed object. You could do it with Brahma Vihara, like, like um, loving kindness or like this heart gladdened or compassion or equanimity, or you could do it with a mantra or a casina, a colored disc, just getting the mind really one pointed and then turning to do vipassana, to watch the arising and passing of those mental states. Or you could do it the other way. You could cultivate vipassana, seeing of the falling away undependable, out of control nature of experience. And then you could use that as a equanimity there as a basis for and developing states of concentration. Or you could do them in tandem. 
weaving in and out, playing the power of the concentration into the vipassana and the power of the vipassana into the tranquility. Or it says a fourth way that you can practice for full liberation is kind of to be seized by the Dhamma. That's how I'll translate it. Dhamma udacca, vigata mana, a mind that is grasped by the restlessness of Dhamma, Dhamma restlessness. So it, it's not quite clear in the text what this means exactly. So you go and look at the commentaries on the, on the original Pali text, and then the commentaries aren't quite clear, so you go look at the sub-commentaries on the commentary. But it's interesting to think about the you know, laying out of different forms of meditation practice and then the formlessness of just being seized by the quality of dhamma, restlessness in the dhamma, the urgency. Um, but the commentaries, when I was looking at them, refer this to this in the context of these corruptions of insight, the upakilesa. So I, I was relaying to you the time as a young monk in Burma, settling into that quiet, lovely, easeful space that Steve dropped us into, and then feeling like, oh, this is great. <laughs> this is lovely. And there's that subtle kind of delight and feeling like, oh, I'm doing great. That makes it that mind making where we just have that slightest bit of holding on to the experience. But that's enough for suffering to creep in, for dukkha to find its doorway in. Our teacher Upandita's teacher, Mahasi Sayada, discusses these kind of um, corruptions of insight at length. And he quotes, this line from the Visuddha Magga that's really great. So basically it says that all of the these different qualities that we can get attached to in practice. There could be a feeling of illumination, there could be this uplifting joy of PT, there could be just the ease, sukha or that feeling of effortless effort. And each of these are not in themselves uh, kilesa, they're not in themselves uh, an unwholesome state, but we can get attached to them. But the line that he, Mahasi quotes is that the nikanti, the um, that subtle grasping itself, we can start to delight in that delighting. <laughs> so we, it can be the object we grasp onto, just like we grasp onto the joy and we grasp onto the ease. But it's not only something we grasp onto, it is also a kind of grasping. That's the line. Just that little delighting. Enough of a hook for me <laughs> to suffer a lot. So the lesson for me that I'm still learning, trying to learn, 
is just with these joyous, uplifting aspects of Dhamma practice, both in the Brahma Vihara realm, with the heart gladdened with mudita, and in the Vipassana realm, the kind of ease that we can drop into right there in the present time awareness. In both ways, the heart can find that ease and that uplifting aspects is so important. It's so important to be rejuvenated, rejuvenated in that way, like a breath of fresh air, a remembering of what's possible. And there's this aspect of equanimity, groundedness, that saves us. That's the refuge there. The, the heart neither grasping after nor pushing away, just resting, imperturbable. And that's what keeps the Brahma Vihara pure and that's what keeps the Vipassana pure. That kind of coming back, resting, without the slightest leaning after experience or away. Just stillness. Let's sit for a minute. Was I on mute the whole time? <laughs> so we'd like to open up to questions like, what was the talk about since you were muted? <laughs> um, if there's any way that we can be of assistance, uh, Steve or Darine or I, to your practice, we'd be grateful for the opportunity. If you have a question, you can um, raise, push the raise your hand button under either reactions or might be um, under participants, or you're welcome to write it in the chat as well. Molly? Hi, thank you very much for the guidance in the sitting and the wonderful talk. And you touched on something, or really the theme of the talk was something that had just been presented in my practice recently. And rad, I, I, it, I actually <laughs> did a little digging on the three papanchas, the uh, craving, conceit, and wrong view. Of, and for me, I, I did a self-bust a lot 
on that word conceit, where in the deepening silences and um, rich experiences in meditating, I, I can feel different congratulatory um, energetics at play. <laughs> and I would ask for a kind of a, what, what do you do with that? What then? Um, I don't see it ever ending, you know? <laughs> it feels like, you know, without, without craving for any particular meditative states to really just sit and be with what is. And when um, quiet, the, the most delicious quietening happens and uh, the heart is gentle and tender and, and um, being in that for a while and then there's this like, you know, like what any 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 guidance for what now like what do you do with that i can just say something really simple um that i i think just to this is deeply ingrained <laughs> in us and that um, solidifying uh, or identification, right? Um, and that's why we're practicing, like, well, of course you will come out. And of course you will, will the I, it, this is me doing it or it's my joy or my peace. Um, it will arise until we are fully liberated. <laughs> and so, we can bring, um, just to acknowledge first, oh, here you are. And like Michelle says, you know, many times, it's just, um, if we can just catch it and say, oh, hello, or, um, right? It, and if you really notice, there is a, a tensing in the body. There is this, um, I'm, saying, I'm doing it with my hand because uh, I cannot find a word, but it's this, uh, which is dukkha. And just see that, that the suffering, that identifying with something, selfing and experience creates in the body. And then you can do, you can bring some compassion for, for that, uh, that tightening. Um, sometimes just seeing it, um, a moment of pure uh, mindfulness will be enough. Sometimes it's not. So I, I, that's um, all I can think right now. Um, Molly, were you were you spe uh, specifically talking about those really uh, deep, quiet restful and knowing meditative states and, and then when you're not in them craving them or while you're in them craving them are both um, not not so much craving as being in them and feeling a slight s sense of that that there's an I there that did it and then there's a rather than there's no I there that did it it's, that seems to be where the, the 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 stronger sense of self comes in at that point. Um, and and on you know less uh, still moments or less that that also comes up where there's this uh, noticing of self congratulations <laughs> when um, those states arise. 
and and I, I thought it was an interesting. Um, I don't even get to the point of wanting to recreate more because I'm just so happy to be where I am. <laughs> but it, there's a there's a sense of an element of me in there. And then when awareness looks at that, what happens? Does it drop away? Is it painful? Yeah, it, 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 it's a little bit of, I'm always using this movie image of this guy who is time traveling, whatever, and he pulls a penny out and it's got the wrong date on it. You know, it's like oh, this sort of like, oh, sh um, the, the state is no longer there. I mean, it's. Oh, you changed. <laughs> you moved up my computer. So, what is there when the state is no longer there? Thinking. I'm back. I, I'm. I'm. There's a lot more. I see. Uh, so back to yeah. discursive mind. Yeah, back to discursive yeah. mind, and that I think that's the. The grief, in a way, of that when the the discursive mind is not there, and there are um, I wouldn't say emptiness because there's a heart, there's a there's a sense of um, holding a a tenderness that is not empty. Mm -hmm. There isn't. There is no thinking about it. And then there's a, a recognition of, in a sense, the aware in, in awareness of that is where I, I notice the little bit of me. Mm -hmm. It's good that you then, To pursue the knowledge of that, you 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 found those three papanchas of conceit, craving, and and wrong view. Um, that I, I was going to say real simply and practically in practice, when that when that comes up, if it comes up again, I, I know you think it comes up forever and ever, as you were saying. <laughs> um, but in the moment when you feel that identification in the moment where that craving or that conceit is there, if you can feel the pain of it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Not think about it. Yeah. So thinking about it is a nice way to defend against mm. that experience, but feel it. Mm. Mm, thank you. That. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Denise. Denise. Hi, thank you Hi. for the practice and the talk again. Uh, as usual, whenever I speak, I have notes because I get nervous. Um, I've been trying over the last few months um, when um, I'm not doing uh, Brahma Vihara practices, when I'm doing more of a Vipassana, working with sensations, to shift, to play around with shifting my anchor away from my breath, because for years it was only breath, how I originally came to the practice, and usually just at my nose. So I'm trying to do a more embodied practice, but it's almost like as maybe I try to notice the sensations on my hands sometimes, it's almost like my my breath or my belly is like a three-year-old screaming for attention. Does this sort of make sense? So I'm trying to you know, and I'll note it sometimes and go, okay, breath, and then kind of explore it. Like sometimes I'll use a little humor. I obviously get these images of little kid, my body being a temper tantrum, but it's kind of like the breath is just wanting attention. Or if I'm focusing to sound, it's like the breath 
it's almost like it feels like the breath becomes exaggerated and it's hard for me to kind of shift and, and sometimes I'm good with it you know I can use a bit of humor I can notice I'm grasping to this ideal of being embodied versus focusing on the breath which I do get is embodied but it, I'm just trying to learn how to play with it a little bit or even if I'm focusing on sound when you uh, guided us uh, today uh, Stephen, I noticed it was almost, I realize I'm a very visual person, but it felt like my ears were going out to the sound versus sitting and receiving. So I noticed there's some grasping. So I'll note grasping, giggle, and then go right back to it. <laughs> and nothing changes. So I'm kind of trying to, I don't know if there's a question in there, but kind of some other ideas of kind of how to work with that in, in um, working skillfully and changing being able to effectively um, work with different anchors versus the breath, if that makes sense. Yeah, it sounds like you're, you're exploring ways to feel an anchor that is both embodied and uh, like the sense of abiding in the present moment where, you, where you're not trying to pulled here and there. You're mm -hmm. looking for a centering anchor in the body, is that right? Yeah, because yeah. I've always used the breath as the focus, and so. But you said at the nostrils. At the nostrils, yeah. yeah. So I'm trying to play with different anchors, like sound, um, smell. Today was the first time, hmm. um, you know, and, and and then even my hands, because quite often you direct us, but quite often I won't even be able to. Mm, like I'll be able to sense it for a second and mm -hmm. then it's like my hands don't exist, right. which is very odd because if I'm doing a movement practice like walking or yoga or Qigong, I, I can feel the body. I don't mm -hmm. know. It's probably just I'm making it more complicated than it needs to be. You Often <laughs> that's what we do. Yeah. How much have you tried to feel the rise and fall of the abdomen? I, I, that I've been able to work with a lot. How's that working? That works well. So I've uh, been over the last few years, I've been able to shift now to the belly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, maybe it'll take me another 10 years to be able to shift to the hands or to the to sound or something else. I don't know. It's been about 10 years I've been working with moving from the nostril to the belly. I'm a slow learner. <laughs> We all are. <laughs> when Upandita was first here in Hawaii uh, and he came to our, our Sunday sitting at the Tan and Sun's house in Kahala and he gave a talk. And in the question and answer period afterwards, um, he said, it doesn't matter, our anchor doesn't matter. The anchor can be anything. Mm -hmm. You know, so we tend to, we tend to offer grounding anchors and embodied anchors to just because particularly um, for overtrained cerebral people um, in today in the modern world, we do think a lot. Upandita thought that Western trained or educated people think a lot more than Eastern people. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, we offer the body, it sounds, the breath, the, the abdomen and so forth. Um, but the truth is, it's, it's kind of relieving to know that the, the anchor can be knowing itself. Just abiding in the knowing itself, awareness of awareness. That's the, perhaps the most subtle of anchors. So, so you know, from there, the choice is all, all things that we experience in the moment, all the phenomena of body and mind that we experience. So, you know, you have you have you have quite a uh, banquet, really, to choose from. And maybe that's what can be for you at times confusing. Mm -hmm. is, is that you, you say, you, you know, you pay attention here and then 
somewhere else in your body is calling out for attention? I, I think more when you guys are guiding us and maybe guiding mm -hmm. us to um, maybe just notice sensations in our hands or whatever. I just yes. notice that it's hard for me to shift from my breath. And I understand it's a choice, but I'm trying to play around with that too. Yes. And it's just fascinating that um, it's hard for me to let go, I guess, of the, the breath. Well, I don't want to let go of my breath, but I just mean the, <laughs> the anger of the breath. Yeah. Yeah. Can I say something, Steve? Yeah. Are you, yeah. I think you have a problem that's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> The, this is just a different way of saying what Steve was saying. As I understand it, what we're aiming to do here is call in these qualities of an alert, relaxed, receiving of experience. And then let those qualities do the practice themselves. We're just inviting in these qualities and then they do it. The rest of the things are just tools for that. Mm -hmm. An anchor, labeling, try looking at your hands, try looking at your breath. But that's not, that's not the aim. You don't need to aim, make it a project about trying to feel your hands or your breath. The project is just inviting these qualities in, an alert, relaxed attention, and then, then let them do it. <laughs> let, let them do the practice. Mm -hmm. And then it doesn't feel like I'm a slow learner, I'm a fast learner, just, you know, an alert, relaxed attention is doing it. And then it falls away and then, oh, come back. And sometimes it's helpful to have an anchor to do that. And sometimes it's not. Perfect. Thank you, both of you. A, a lot of the a lot of the ordained sangha in Asia, uh, I think you might know Marjik. It's the reason why they that's what they have the, those beads for, right? So there's something tangible, and they move through the 108 beads as a as a just another way of uh, keeping the mind focused for samadhi, for concentration? For sure, it's samadhi practice. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of them are doing virtues of the Buddha. Virtues of the Buddha, yeah. I think that's a lot of what folks are doing. Um, you know, we had a friend in the Sagain Hills who died when he was 99. And when I first went to see him, I kind of had a naive idea that everybody was just doing Satipatthana practice all the time this kind of mindfulness practice. But really there's a real range of the different ways people are supporting their practice there. And he, Myatan Seyra, who was a very, very happy being. <laughs> um, he said his practice was like going to a garden and sometimes he would do, find the metta flower and sometimes he would go pick these amazing qualities of the Buddha. Like if you think of how hard it is for us to practice and that's like, we have teachers, you know, we have friends like this supporting us right now. Somebody did this and discovered this on their own. That's amazing. <laughs> that's a quality of the Buddha. So they reflect on things like that. <laughs> so what I say, metta and qualities of the Buddha and then the Parts of the body, a way of decreasing the, the grasping after idea of beauty of a body. And then just the reflection, sobriety, reflection on we're going to die. Myatan Seyra, the happy Seyra, would, my dad had just been treated for cancer and he came to Burma and he came into Myatan Seyra's place and my dad's not that useful, used to the whole Buddhist thing. And he's sort of, sort of awkwardly on his knees and yeah, Tansayata pointed at him and said, you, you could die on this in-breath. 
you could die on this outfit. <laughs> <laughs> he really, he loved that. He was great like that. That's what he practiced. Metta, virtues of the Buddha, uh, parts of the body, and reflection on death. That's mainly what he did. Sorry, that was a tangent, but hopefully it was enjoyable. <laughs> Amanda. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to how to work with giddiness. I know you talked about that not having the equanimity beneath it. And um, I feel like that's something that comes up a lot for me in daily life where I get excited about something, but then I get really excited about it. And it seems like there's some quality that's kind of similar to anxiety, but, but feels, um, yeah, I don't, I guess I don't want to come in and like squash it. Um, and, and squash the, the joy associated. But I, I feel like I, I easily go to that place and in, it's kind of like at this high frequency um, vibration. Uh, yeah, so I know you brought that up a little bit in your talk. If you could speak to that anymore, that would be great. Yeah, I'll try and say something and then I'd be delighted to hear Steve has, Steve has something or um, anyone else wants to. <laughs> jump in um but i'll try and say something yeah i think for me too so i will just say when this was being pointed out to me it was being pointed out about me i was like <laughs> <laughs> but but it's true <laughs> it's true and um it was also being pointed out about somebody uh, close to me uh my my family lineage um, a pattern that kind of handed down in my family of like really being excited about your own values but being so excited about your own values you don't see your kind of just in that excitement dismissing somebody else's but I definitely think that um, under that is an anxiety for sure in me in this family lineage that that is so I, that resonates for me when you speak about the anxiety there um i i don't i don't know if yours is manifesting in, in you know the same content way but it sounds like in terms of mental states like underneath it a kind of agitation anxiety um driving a a bubbly uh, almost sometimes giddy energy mm -hmm. And, and one thing that's interesting about that bubbly, anxious, restless energy, it's, it's very difficult actually to get the Satipatthana mind to rest on that for me. It just bounce, bounce, bounce and off into different papancha thoughts, right? So, um, so I, I'm kind of brainstorming as much as you here, but maybe we could like really just feel the whole texture of that. Not, not try and be too precise because it's just gonna bounce. You know, it's like if, if, I'm, if I'm trying to, oh, what, what does this anxiety really feel like? I think I might just go off into the punch up, but maybe just a really from a broad brushstrokes way, just get a sense of the texture of that state and how it's shifting and what's coming next. But also, maybe like Steve was pointing out earlier, to feel the wearisome aspects of that, just to tune into the, and this is true of this quality called in the Pali Piti, of the bubbly energy, mm -hmm. that if we start to tune into the weary, wearisome nature of that, um, it really has a profound lesson to teach about uh, the relief of, of the heart settling, settling down. So not, you know, not that we're like longing after, oh, I wish this would go away so I can feel peace, but just tuning into the wearisome nature 
of that giddiness, the, the, roughness, I'm not getting the right word, <laughs> uh, of that itself might be interesting. I wonder about that. Steve, do you have any thought? I think weariness is a, is a good term. Uh, and, and to look at it, feel it to the point of, um, of disenchantment. Is it, maybe it's a kind of defense is it old for you? Is it something that you've been doing as long as you remember? Yes, yeah. and also familial. Um, <laughs> so yeah. I, I think it's a survival strategy. <laughs> yeah. hmm. Right. So, yeah, a kind of wondering mind. Oh, I, I wonder why I do this. You know, without needing an immediate answer. Mm -hmm. Particularly because it's so ingrained or familial or you know, just so old, it might have, might have been happening uh, in your pre-verbal development. It might have been going on and, and, you, and you picked it up. But, you know, it's a kind of, as you can see, you, you do feel an anxiety with that. So there's a pain in that. And um, the other side of desiring that, that uplifting joy, uh, is fear of losing it, mm -hmm. you know? So uh, all kind of tied together by, by anxiousness. So, I mean, which is just another def a definition for, for dukkha. <laughs> and so to ask, you know, when we, when we look at it carefully and curiously, you know, when I look at those states of mind that feel repetitive and habitual, uh, I try to feel the underlying pain of it, not particularly finding, uh, you know, the key to its origination, you know, where it came from, why it's there, mm -hmm. but just ways of actually holding it n now, right now, when it's coming up and, and feeling the different aspects of it. And when you realize that, yeah, yeah, this is old and it is familial, that should help relax around it because in, and or if you see that, yeah, this helps, this has helped me. This has helped me survive. This has helped me get through rough, some rough spot, rough spots. But, but now, you know, there's also the anxious bit of it that is a, that, um, that feels like it maybe drains some of your energy, your Dhamma energy. And, and, and it's, it's painful, you know, so to be, to be able to kind of side by side while, while it's happening, not try to squash it, but to, but to see it, to care for it with compassion and investigate it, you know, with, with awareness, oh, this is happening. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Because it is. You know, we're all interesting configurations of many different forces, of karmic forces and genetic forces and cultural, educational, and just how our personalities are formed and are continuing to form and transform. You know, it's fascinating. Like Darine was saying. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for asking my question. That was great. We got to hear Steve speak on it. <laughs> wow, what's a good day? Good inquiry. It's a nice, nice moment to be awake, to be alive, to be present for each other. I'm grateful to all of you. Jake, thanks for the talk. Darine, Amanda, 
all the yogis. We'll see you next week, Sunday, and between now and then, I wonder what will happen. Aloha. 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 Thank you, everyone.